I'm going to tell you the story of Lily Mae Alsop Dugdale, who was my great-grandmother. So for my grandchildren, she'd be their third great-grandmother on Grandma Frederick's side of the family. Lily Mae, she went by Mae, Alsop Dugdale, was the second child of William and Helen Alsop. She was born February 23, 1866, in Moccasin, Illinois. In her life story, she said, My mother and sister Adelaide died in 1869. My sister died September 26, and my mother died three years later on September 29. My brother Charles was three years older than I, while my sister Adelaide was about three years younger. May wrote a short life story up until she was married, and that's the part I want to share for this presentation. Much of this will be in her own words. Her life story is full of very interesting things, and it reminded me a lot of the stories from the Little House on the Prairie books. I'm going to tell you a story about her life when she was 19 to 20 years old. When May was 19 years old, her father decided to leave their 40-acre farm in Illinois and move to Nebraska to stake a claim on land there. They spent a year preparing for this move. This is what she said. We folks canned over 400 quarts of fruit and we dried apples to make it go further. Ma made big 60-gallon barrel of soft soap and we had smoked meat too, so we felt pretty well supplied in a way. The winter before we left, my father cut and hauled logs to a mill and had all the material cut into proper sizes for a house on our homestead, with all the shingles, flooring, sills, joists, studding, and lathes too. He floored a rail car with heavy timbers and the flooring boards. He brought everything he could so that we would be nice and comfortable. We brought some cows, pigs, chickens, and every household article we could to get settled. It's surprising how much stuff you can put into one of the loaded freight cars. They even left a small room in loading the things up, so a couple of the neighbor boys could ride out there without being seen. Ma, Ida, and I came to Nebraska on a passenger train. We left April 1st, 1886. I remember one evening on the train, I wanted Ma to let me buy us an orange apiece for our supper. But she said, let's wait till morning. They were five cents each then. Well, in the morning, as we neared Lincoln, Nebraska, I saw the same boy with the same oranges, and I offered to pay him for three oranges, 15 cents. He said, no, these oranges are 10 cents each. I told him he'd only asked for five cents last night, and he said, oh, but we're in Nebraska now. Wasn't I the angry one? We first settled in Buffalo, Nebraska, awaiting for our claim to get cleared. A few months later, May, now 20 years old, filed for her own claim of 160 acres. She said, I went to McCook County and filed my claim in the fall of 1886. It is near the town of what is now Enders, Nebraska, which was established in the 1890s. The whole county of Chase, Nebraska today is about 890 square miles and in 2010 it only had a population of under 4,000. So it's almost in the middle of nowhere even today. Here's a copy of her land grant with a description on where the property is located. Today it looks just like a field of circles that you would see from an airplane flying over the middle of the United States. I cannot imagine a 20 year old lady in the 1880s alone in this area. She was certainly a woman of a lot of adventure and bravery. She goes on to say, I did not have to go to live on it for six months. So in the meantime, we built a good sod house on it, and I took up my residence there in April. The sod house, or soddy, was a successor to the log cabin. The prairie lacked the standard building materials, such as wood and stone. However, sod was made from thickly rooted prairie grass, which was abundant. The prairie grass had a much thicker and tougher root structure than modern landscaping grass. Construction of a sod house involved cutting patches of sod into rectangles, often two feet by one feet by six inches, and then piling them into walls. Builders employed a variety of roofing materials. Sod houses accommodate normal doors and windows. The resulting structure was quite well insulated, but it could be damp and it was very inexpensive to build. Sod houses required frequent maintenance and were vulnerable to a lot of rain damage. 
She went on to say, I was seven miles from my father's place, and it was three and a half miles from my place to the river, and three and a half from there on south to his homestead. Sometimes I would watch for his team coming for water. I would walk my half of the way and meet him in the river and ride home with him. Can you imagine having to walk three and a half miles to get water and to carry it back to your place every day? She said, our road to the river from my father's place ran through a real prairie dog town. Almost everyone knows prairie dogs, rattlesnakes, and little red owls all live in the same holes. We seldom drove through this place that we didn't see several rattlesnakes. In those days, most everyone would stop and kill a rattlesnake wherever they saw it. We would all go prepared. To us, they were a common nuisance. My claim soddy was 11 by 12 feet in size. One of those original little homes that you see are, that are popular today. At first I had no plaster on the walls, so some of my friends would tease me and tell me stories of how snakes would crawl through the openings in the sod walls and could be found inside the house. Well, I laughed it off until one time I saw a garter snake between the sods about as high as my face. I knocked it down and killed it. Then another time I was sitting sewing just inside my window when I saw a movement at the window and a big four-foot bull snake was on the window ledge running his head back and forth across the window panes trying to find a way to get inside. I grabbed my hoe and killed him. Then later a neighboring homesteader opened his door to his dugout late one night and the buzz and whir of a rattlesnake greeted him. He hastily lit a lantern and shot and killed it. So then my brother came to my rescue. He hauled native gypsum in, and that with lime, he plastered my walls all safe for me. My first night alone on my claim was one that to be remembered. It was raining, and the patter of rain on the sod roof and stovepipe sounded musical, but very lonely and very mysterious. The highlight of the night was the continual howling and yelping of coyotes. I was a stranger in a strange land and had never listened to coyotes before. My imagination seemed to run away with me. I imagined a whole pack of them when perhaps there were only two or three. Also I lay awake for hours wondering whether they would dig through my sod wall or not. Anyway, I was sure glad when morning came. While I was latching on my claim in the summer of 1887, my stepmother gave me a little chicken for a pet. It was lots of company for me, and it would come wherever I called it. It was not so bad, after all, for a young woman with no team of animals and no fuel to cook with and heat, except for cow chips. Some more ladylike folks called them buffalo chips. In the summertime, we used to take the team and baskets and fill up a big load of buffalo chips or cow pies and pile them in the barn to keep them dry. They made very good fuel, about like corn cobs, but neither stores up much lasting heat like coal so we would mainly use them in the warmer weather. I don't tell you how my sod was furnished to brag, but I had the cutest little home of any of the young homesteaders, with all the trimmings for either a boy or a girl. I made it into a real home. I had a good bed, stove, and trunk. Then I got a box and fitted shelves into it. I made pretty curtains for the door, and in front of the cupboards and window, I bought a small table and chairs. My brother plastered walls and had some pretty colored prints and pictures that I put on those walls. I even split corn stalks and made picture frames. I had it all neat and beautiful. I carried my leftover sod from building my house outside and made a narrow flower bed around my whole house and extended it about five feet on each side of the doorway. I drove a long stick up either side of the doorway into the wall and trained morning glories across the space and above the door, so one seemed to enter the, a bower of beautiful blossoms when they came inside my house. In November 1887, I proved upon my preemption, and then I went to live in Imperial, Nebraska for the winter, so I could take music lessons. I had bought me an organ to take back to my sod home and enjoyed playing and practicing with it. 
My neighbor, the company superintendent, offered a prize to the one of us young homesteaders who raised the largest watermelon from seed that he gave us. We all tried, and I had the finest one. I had a nice big melon patch. We had to have ten acres of land plowed and planted in corn and other things like potatoes in order to prove and keep our claim. There was a camp at the lower end of my homestead building for a grading crew for the new railroad in Burlington. There were about 50 men in that grading camp. On Saturday afternoon, many of them would go to Juanetta, Nebraska and get on a big drunk with Sunday ahead to sober up. One Saturday in the early fall, a neighbor came by and told me I'd better bring my best melons into the house or I would lose them that night. I carried about 40 or 50 watermelon into my soddy. My prized melon was not quite ripe, so I dug a hole and gently put a big melon into it and covered it over carefully. Well, sometime toward morning, a gang of hoodlums came by, and they were so angry to find no ripe melons. They smashed and destroyed every melon that I had left out, it seemed, but they'd never find my prized melon. So I won the contest. About two months after we located on our claim, a young man came to ask my father to help him take the shoes off his horse as she had gone and lost one of the shoes. His name was James Dugdale. He owned a half a section of land near the well where we hauled water from. He also was from Buffalo County, Nebraska, and was the first white boy to be born there. May says, we never had an introduction, nor needed one in that newly settled country. We just met and talked and soon were good friends. Finally, we fell in love with each other and were married a few months after I proved on my claim on March 13, 1888. I did not care to live the three years on my homestead, so I did what many others did. I commuted my homestead into a preemption and proved up on it seven months. We then went by train to Buffalo, Nebraska, where Jim had a claim and we made our farm and began to raise our family there and make a home.